Good morning. All right. First thing, I want you to take a look around you. I want you to notice who's not here. Make a mental note. This week, I want you to pray for them. Whatever God would lead you to pray. And then give them a call. Let them know you missed them. Okay? I know that's my job. I only got two eyes. And there's a lot of empty seats. And with you guys keep moving around from seat to seat, I don't know who's supposed to be there. But we're a family. We're a body. We look out for one another. Okay? I have a couple ask the pastor questions um, that I want to settle out today. If you have your Bible, open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. <clears throat> First Corinthians 15, and the question is concerning verse 29. I'll give you just a minute to catch up. You know what I, I'm trying to give you a chance to catch up. I hear pages turning. And then when the pages stop turning, I figure you either found it or you gave up. <laughs> but sometimes I think you people just sit there and go. Okay, verse 29. Otherwise, what do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people being baptized on their behalf? Um, does anybody have the NASB? Mm -hmm. Somebody read it from the NASB, please. Otherwise, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why then are they baptized for them? Okay. The question being, it's not really kind of phrased as a question. It says, baptized on behalf of the dead, question mark. <laughs> So I'm going to answer that as though the question is, what's up with the baptism of the dead? Now I asked it to be read from the NASB because the NASB translates a particular word properly that some of the translations do not. And this word hinges, this, this verse hinges on this word. Okay? So the first thing we need to do before we get into this verse is we need to understand some of the laws, some of the governing rules of hermeneutics. Okay? Hermeneutics is a fancy way to say Bible study. I went to college for that. I don't know that I got my money's worth. Okay, hermeneutics. The first rule of hermeneutics is that all scripture is interpreted in light of all scripture. Okay? That means that when you read a particular verse, you're not supposed to just read a particular verse. You read it in the context of the entire scripture. Okay? One of the other rules of hermeneutics is that you must read the passage in light of the context in which it's relayed. Okay? Meaning, you don't just pick out a verse or a fragment out of the middle of a paragraph. You read the paragraph so you understand why the author is saying this. Okay? Another rule of hermeneutics is you have to understand the person, the place, the time. You have to understand why is the author writing, to whom is the author writing, and what was going on at the time that necessitated him writing. Okay? So we need to back up in order to answer this question we need to apply each of those rules. All right? So we're going to go down. We're going to look at each of these rules, but I'm going to kind of work at them in a little bit different order. Um, we're going to back up a few verses, actually quite a few verses, because verse 29 
is not a statement unto itself. It is a thought that Paul is using to help establish what he's speaking about. We back up all the way back up here to verse 12. We see what Paul is speaking about. He says, now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Okay. Going on down through this, the entire context of what Paul is addressing is the resurrection of the dead. Okay? He is talking about, hey, look, our whole faith is based on, it's predicated on the idea that when Christ died, was placed in the grave, three days later, he rose again as the first fruits. Kind of ties in with our, our series, doesn't it? He was the first fruits of the dead. There were other people that were raised from the dead before him. There were people that have been raised from the dead since him but none of them to eternal life yet. Okay? He is the first fruits because he's the first one to be raised from the dead differently. He had a different body. He had a different appearance. He was able to do things that he couldn't do before. Okay? So the, the context of what is being said here is the resurrection of the dead. So we see the context. Now, one of the things that we need to do, we need to understand a, a little bit about who he's writing to. If you look at Greece, you go down to the bottom, there's the isthmus down at the bottom, and then there's a little land bridge that kind of connects it to the, the peninsula. And just to the east of that is Corinth. If you go west and a little bit south, you run into another city, I got to look at it because it's not one that I, I learned. Um, Eleusis. Eleusis had a peculiar belief that if you were baptized in their waters, you could gain eternal life. Okay? <coughs> Just their waters. Even though it's all connected. And, and it's all dumping out and being receiving water from the Mediter Mediterranean Sea. The, the, it, just that little peninsula there, that little gulf, if you were baptized in there, you could attain eternal life. Now, the Corinthians would have known about this because this is about a day's journey away from Corinth. And these were cities that traded and had commerce between one another. So the customs would not have been unfamiliar to the Corinthians. Okay? Now we know Paul spent time with the Corinthians, establishing the church there, helping them get everything settled and grounded. We know that he visited there on at least one other occasion, possibly several other occasions. So we know that Paul, who ministered in that area, was probably aware of this, this peculiarity of Eleusis. All right? So Paul is laying out his argument about um, being raised from the dead, if you look down in verse 20, it says, But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Okay? So, um, for as by a man came death, by a man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. So we go down further, and I'm, I'm actually going to touch on this, this section a little bit more in today's... Maybe not today's. In the, the, the message that we're working on, the Feast of Trumpets, we're going to deal with a, a passage right around here. But, but what I want you to understand is this series coming on here, what he's talking about is he's talking about the resurrection of the dead. And then he appends this, he, he gives them an example. Okay? He says, you know, resurrection of the dead is such an obvious thing that even the pagans are doing it. And he's talking about the, the baptism of the dead, why would, you, why would these pagans even baptize if there was no resurrection from the dead? Why, why would they even do that? Now the key word, um, I'm going to read my verse here, and then Christy, I would like you to read yours as well. Um, verse 29 says, Otherwise, what do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized on their behalf? Now listen to how she reads it and see if you pick up on a key word 
That mine, mine translated differently. Go ahead. Otherwise, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why then are they baptized for them? Anybody pick up on the word? All of them? Nope. What will they do? They. My passage reads, uh, if the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized on the dead, on behalf of the dead? The actual word is a third person plural in the Greek. And literally translated, it means they. This is important. Because Paul is using an example from outside of the church to reinforce a teaching of the church. He is speaking into their culture something that they would be familiar with, something that they would understand. And he's doing it such that he assumes the reader is keeping up with him because they're in that culture, they're in that time. He specifically uses the word they, in some translations, it's uh, my translation, they, they actually changed it to um, why are people, they generalized it. Does anybody have something else written in there, besides by people or they, a different translation? Okay, why is this important? I think it's absolutely critical, because Paul is not saying we do this. He's saying... They do this. Pastor Dislin says those. those. Those? Okay. Why do those? Again, a differentiation between us and them. Now, this is a, 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 a passage of scripture that at least one cult, actually several cults, have keyed in on and made a doctrine out of because they have misinterpreted this one passage. They've not applied proper hermeneutics to the passage. So our first law was all scripture is interpreted in light of all scripture. There is nowhere else in scripture. There is no directive. There is no command anywhere in all of scripture that says you, sh you must baptize on behalf of the dead. As a matter of fact, scripture tells us that salvation does not come by baptism. That baptism is a result of salvation. Because it's something you do. Ephesians chapter 2 says that we are saved by grace through faith. Not of works lest any man should boast. Romans says that if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart, then we are saved. Okay, see there's, there's no predicated condition other than God's grace and the faith that he gives us that we must apply. That is salvation. This being the case, only an individual can do it for themselves. Nobody else can do it for you. Now, in the Mormon church, they do baptisms for the dead um, regularly. And what they do is this person takes the place of someone that's gone on and is baptized for them so that they can achieve whatever place in heaven that, that they're targeting. I don't know. Okay? Because I know in, in Mormonism there's three different levels of heaven. And, and they're, they're thinking, based on the misinterpretation of this passage, is that if I can be baptized on behalf of someone that went to the grave without being saved... This will get them saved. It doesn't work that way, folks. There's only two people involved in your salvation. That's you and God. Okay? Can't get in there with mommy or daddy. Can't get in there on grandpa's faith. Can't get in there by the people you sit with at church or the particular chair you sit in. It's only that, that relationship, that dynamic between you and God. And it is never predicated on your work. Never. Work will follow after. If you have been raised a new creation, works will follow after. Because the following verse in Ephesians chapter 2 says that God has prepared these in advance for us to do them. But after salvation. Okay? So baptism of the dead, um, we understand that Paul was writing to a specific culture, a specific issue, 
It, the, the passage is not addressing the baptism of the dead. It's, it's using that as an example that, hey, look, even the pagans get this. Why are you so hard to understand? Why is this so difficult? Look, if, you, if you're having trouble with... Let, let's back up for just a minute. When Paul went and he established the churches, we know on his first missionary journey that each time he came into a, a city, he and Barnabas would go first to the synagogue and they would teach the, the gospel. They would share the gospel. And they would teach out of the scriptures how Jesus fulfilled every, every prophecy that was in the Hebrew Bible in his first coming. And then a weird thing would happen. They would, some people would immediately join them and others would immediately set themselves against them. Okay, And then at some point in there, Paul and Barnabas would leave the synagogue and they would go to a community area. Now sometimes it was a forum, sometimes it was a coliseum or a stadium or, or a theater. Sometimes it was just the marketplace where people would gather. They would go out and they would share with the Gentiles. Okay, Now what happened is that after they left, there were those that came in that sought to combine this new faith in Christ with the legal restrictions of the Mosaic Law. Paul calls them the Judaizers. And they would come in and they would say, yes, 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 Jesus, grace, faith, works. If, you're, if you want to be saved, you have these, but you must have these as well. We see this in Galatians where they're dealing with the whole issue of circumcision. The Jewish uh, leaders have come in behind, and, and, and keep in mind, they are still professing Christ. But they're adding Christ to the law. Okay? They're not, it's not just faith and grace, it's circumcision and the Mosaic Law and, and all of the religious things that go with that. Okay? Now, remember in, in the Gospels, there were two parties among the leadership of the religious leaders of the Jews. They were the Pharisees and Sadducees. What was one of the key differences between their theology? Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. Remember, it was the Sadducees that came to Jesus and they gave him a, a numbers problem. Rabbi, we know that you're good and you, your teaching is good, but there was a man who married a woman. And this man had seven brothers, and he died before he could uh, give her a child, and so she was given in marriage to the second brother, but he also died, and on down the line until all of them were dead, and then finally she died. So, Master, whose wife was she in heaven? Because, see, their whole point is they want Jesus to go, well, of course not. No, they're, she's not resurrected. None of them are resurrected. It's done. And he said, you don't understand the scriptures. And he met them right point blank. He said, you, you, you're, you're, you're speaking out of your neck because you don't understand what's going on here. The Sadducees did not believe that there was a resurrection coming. This is actually in line with Greek thinking. Remember, historically, the Sadducees kind of gave themselves over to the Hellenist teachings. And one of the Hellenist teachings was, um, um, oh, I just lost it. It was there and it's gone. You know, I pray every morning that if, uh, with that I preach to God, if there's something you don't want me to say, shut my mouth. <laughs> he just took it right out of my head. <laughs> it's gone. All right, back to the main point. Uh, so, of the Christians that were saved from the Jews, that, that, that the Jewish, the Messianic believers, some of them had to be Sadducees. Okay? And as such... If they were going around and they were trying to teach people to follow not just Christ, but the law of Moses, this would have been one of the teachings that they would have found was important. It was important enough that it was a, a schism between them and the Pharisees. Okay, So, resurrection of the dead is a significant issue 
for specifically the church at Corinth, but for us today as well. Because if Christ has not been raised from the dead, if there is no resurrection from the dead, then we are a people without hope and we are to be pitied among all men. Okay? So the baptism of the dead, the scripture's not telling us to do that. Paul is using it as an example to a particular people who would understand what he is talking about so that he can reinforce the understanding that yes, the dead will be raised again. The believers to an eternal life and glory and the unbelievers to an eternity separated from God. Everybody's going to get resurrected. Okay? Assuming you die before he comes back and all of that goes on. So, that is the first question. Second question. Um, this, this one did not have a name on it. So if this is your question... Um, I'm leaving it up here on the table. The second one, um, the question is, where did the Gentiles come from, and how do we come from the lineage of David since we are not Jewish? <coughs> this is a, a, an interesting one. Um, who are the Gentiles? Hey, Steve, I found your paper. <laughs> um, the word Gentile is a translation from two different words. In the Hebrew, the word is goyim. And in the Greek, the word is ethnos. The words both mean people or nations. Okay? And so, when we hear the word Gentile... Um, how many of you hear the word Gentile and kind of get like a, uh, that's not a very good thing to call someone? It, it's almost like a bad word. How many of you don't have any feeling one way or the other? Okay. See, I, I grew up with this understanding that a Gentile was a bad thing because reading through Scripture, whenever the, the Gentiles are mentioned by the Jews, it's always in a negative connotation. They, they often refer to the Gentiles uh, in Scripture as um, pagans because they didn't have the law, and they even called them dogs. Because see, when God called the Jews out of all the nations, he made them his own, he gave them his laws, and he made them unique of all people. Why? Why did God do this? Anybody? Because he's God, yes, but there was a, a purpose in this. It wasn't just so that they could blow their own horn, that they could be, oh, look at us. There was a reason. So, so they could witness to, of God to the world. That's exactly right. When God chose them, he placed them at a strategic crossroads in the world. Because, see, the crossroads there came from Europe down to Africa, from Egypt over to Assyria and Babylon. Anything that was going on between nations eventually made its way through Israel. All right? God put them there so that he could, they could bear witness, they could testify about who he was. Now, before you get uh, any kind of negative ideas about the Jews, you and I would have been exactly the same. And sometimes we are exactly the same. Because, see, they got this all we're special. God chose us out of all the people of the earth. There are no other gods. Isaiah... 43.10, there is none before me, there will be none after me. I know of no other gods. Okay? And, and, then, and instead of being like, hey, I got to tell you something awesome. Let me share with you about the one true God. Instead of doing that, they're like, you don't have the truth. You're scum. Don't you stay over there. I, you know what? We don't want you in our area, and we sure as heck aren't going in your area, so just... <laughs> Paul says that Jesus got rid of that in Colossians 1 says that he removed the dividing wall of hostility the barrier Okay, so the Gentiles are everybody that is not Jewish and even more than that not completely Jewish Okay? Because they looked at the Samaritans, who were the Jews that were left behind when 
they went into exile, and they intermarried among all the other people that, that were pushed into the land. And then when the, the real Jews came back, they said, you, you've violated God's law. You've, 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 you've intermarried with the other nations. You can't be a part of us anymore. And so even those people were, were pushed out and, and, and called other. So Gentile is the nations that are not Jewish. The people that are not Jewish. That's us. We're the Gentiles. Okay? Now, thanks be to God, because when Jesus came, he didn't come just to save the Jews. John 3.16, for God so loved only the Jews. <laughs> the world that he sent his only begotten son remember the prophecy given to Adam and Eve in the garden when God was cursing the snake he talked about Eve's seed somebody born of a woman <coughs> would bruise the head of the serpent okay when God gave that promise, that prophecy, there were no Jews. They hadn't come along yet. Okay? Jesus fulfilled part of that prophecy. I believe there's more of that to be fulfilled later. Isaiah 42. Flip over there with me real quick. Isaiah chapter 42. I'm going to read verse 1 and verse 6. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. Okay, do you, do you understand what God is speaking about here? Does that sound familiar to anyone? Yeah. Jesus. Yeah. In whom my soul delights, I will put my spirit on him. Remember, on two different occasions, uh, when he was baptized and on the Mount of Transfiguration, uh, the spirit came down, God spoke. This is my beloved son and with whom I am well pleased. That, that's the fulfillment of this. But see, that verse doesn't end there because after it says, I have put my spirit on him, he says, he will bring forth justice to the nations. Okay? Now flip over to verse 6. The Gentiles, yep. Um, actually, in, in some translations, it'll even read the pagans. Okay? Verse 6. Uh, I am the Lord, I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations. See, the, the whole plan and purpose of God was that through the Jews, through Abraham's seed, he would bless the world. He would make a way for the world to be able to be restored to a right relationship with him. Now, just real quickly, a, a kind of a segue here, just a, an aside. Um, the Jews were given the law not because God thought they could keep it. God knew they wouldn't be able to keep the law. How do we know he knew? Because every year they had to have atonement made for them because God knew that every year they were going to sin. They were going to get in trouble. They, they, there was no way that they could possibly keep all of the law. Especially when you understand that the law isn't just what you do, it's what's inside of you. Okay, and when you violate it inside of you, God sees that as a violation of his law. The law was put into effect so that we would see our desperate need for salvation, for redemption. They didn't, they okay. didn't understand that. They thought it was just an outward work thing, though, didn't they? Yes, even though throughout the, the, the Old Testament, throughout the Hebrew Bible, God would remind them frequently that it was what was inside of them that got them in trouble. Because Jesus said nothing comes out except what's inside. 
Okay? So, who are the Gentiles? That's us. God gave the Jews the law so that they would see that there was no possible way that anyone could ever achieve a righteousness of their own that would give them any end with God. Okay? So the law was put into effect to, to show us our need for a Savior. Right? So now the second part of the question is... Um, How do we come from the lineage of David since we are not Jewish? We don't. That was easy. <laughs> Scripture does not say that we come from the line of David. <clears throat> Excuse me. Scripture says that Jesus came from the line of David. And, and there's a whole study. We talked about this a couple months back about the lineage of David both through his father and his mother even though his biological father uh, was was the heavenly father and, and not not Joseph but even even though Joseph was his adopted father he had all the rights to Joseph's lineage when he became adopted he received everything that a natural child would that's a perfect example of how God deals with us as his adopted children we are entitled to every right of, of his natural children child being Jesus Christ okay so, Jesus is of the line of David. An argument could be made that because we are adopted and Jesus is our brother, that somehow, some way, that works us into the line of David. But to me, that's a stretch. However, we are of the line of Abraham, even though we're not Jewish. Galatians uh, chapter 4 talks about that in, in quite a bit of depth, that... Uh, because we, chapters 3 and 4, because we believed, because we have faith, we are accounted not as the physical offspring of Abraham, which is the Jews, but as the spiritual offspring of Abraham. As he believed, as we believe, we become. Okay? So, Abraham believed and it was counted to him as righteousness. This was 400 years before the law was even given. He was considered righteous before the law. And we, 4,000 years after the law has been given, believe, and therefore our, uh, the, the curse of the law is removed from us. Okay? So as to the second part, um, we're, we're not of the line of David, but we are accounted of the lineage of Abraham as spiritual children because we believe. Does that make sense? Okay. I will put both of these up here on the desk um, so you guys can grab them afterwards. There's more, uh, I go into quite a bit more depth in what I wrote here with the different passages being cited. Um, all right, so let's get to today's message. Um, I'm only going to cover one little part today, and it's right where we ended last week. Um, we are talking about Rosh Hashanah, Leviticus 23. Verses 23 through 25. Go ahead and flip over there real quick. <clears throat> I have something that we're going to do today that uh, I think will bless you. If not in the moment, then with understanding. Leviticus 23, picking up in verse 23, says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall observe a day of solemn rest, a memorial proclaimed with the blast of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work, and you shall present a food offering to the Lord. Okay? So, Last week we talked about the different names. Um, we talked about some of the customs. Next week I'm going to wrap up uh, this part of it with the um, Hebrew scriptures that, that tell us about the Feast of Trumpets. And, and what I really want to get to is how does this apply to us? Because we look at the first four feasts and we see that they have been fulfilled with the first advent of Christ. And you know that those first four feasts came within a relatively short period of time. Fifty days from the first to the last of the spring feasts. It's a very relatively short amount of time. Okay? Then we have 
this, this period through the summer, and then we get to the fall, and then we have another series of feasts. And again, they come very close together, very tightly packed. I believe that God is speaking prophetically through these because we've seen the fulfillment of the first four. And I think right now we're in that summer period, the age of the church. Okay? And then the Feast of Trumpets blows on the first of Tishri. And then a few days later we go into Yom Kippur, the Feast of Atonement. And then the whole thing is wrapped up with the Feast of Tabernacles. Okay? So, today... I want to share with you about the trumpets being blown. Now, if you notice here, there are a couple things that it says. It gives us a specific day that this is to be done, the first day of the seventh month, that you are to have a solemn rest. This means that this is a Sabbath. Okay? This is the, the Sabbath equivalent, what, what the Jews would call a high Sabbath. Okay? Um, a memorial... But, but you notice it doesn't say what the memorial is for. It says to remember. I do this all the time. Leaving the house this morning, I'm thinking, I know there was something I was supposed to grab. And I got to church, and I, I didn't remember what it was until I saw Steve. <laughs> oh, the papers! I forgot the papers! Which I only forgot one. I didn't forget both. So I'm only half off. But, but you know, God is giving this, them this as a memorial, something to remember, but he doesn't tell them what they're supposed to remember. Okay? I think that's going to be important as, as we see how this thing unfolds. Then it goes on, and it says, A memorial proclaimed with the blast of trumpets. Okay, I'm, I'm, this is where I have to give you the warning. It's going to get loud. Okay? Um, Steve... And Nathan have been working on putting together the trumpet blast that is sounded at the Feast of Trumpets. And so I'm going to turn the service over to uh, Steve and Nathan at this point because there's a whole explanation as to what these particular sounds mean. And this is important because we're going to see this as we understand how this feast applies to us. Okay, Steve, it's all up to you. Andy. <laughs> All right. Um, stop up here. Grab your shoe pointer. All right, so bear with me. Um, There are four types of blasts that we want to share with you today. Um, They're associated with the Feasts of Trumpets and Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And, and you can do a Google search on this. And depending on what source you use, uh, the meanings of each blast may vary slightly to some extravagant, significantly different stuff. You know, whether you look at stuff written by Orthodox Jews, Conservative Jews, Reformed Jews, uh, Messianic Jews, there's four, or I mean several different ways to interpret things. Honestly, within the Orthodox Judaism alone, you're going to come up with several different meanings for each of these blasts. And that's okay, because, you know, it is what it is. Um, I tend to look towards Orthodox um, stuff, and I flavored that from a Messianic point of view because this all ties in with um, our being grafted in to, uh, to God's branch and to uh, associate it with uh, the end times. So that's where I'm coming from. Um, so I'm gonna briefly attempt to uh, share the name and uh, a little description of each one of these blasts. I'm going to have Nathan uh, blow each uh, sound and we'll just try to move on from here. So the first blast you're going to hear is known as Tekiya. So this is a long blast and it's one that was used at a king's coronation. Um, note that, that's very interesting. 
king's coronation. Mm -hmm. We as believers in Jesus, we recognize his kingship over our lives and that he will be Israel's king, ruling the nations from David's throne in, Israel, in uh, Jerusalem, that which we call the thousand year reign of Christ, after which his kingdom will reign forever and ever, according to the latter chapters of the book of Revelation. So Nathan, would you sound the tekiah? Try. <laughs> Great. So, the second blast is known as shevarim. Now this word means broken or to break. And that, just take notice of that too. Uh, this blast consists of three broken notes. This reminds one of their sins over the past year. And yet, you know, one thing you have to remember is that to the Jewish person, and Glenn alluded to this and brought this up, and I'm sure he will, will bring this uh, more to light. Um, the Feast of, uh, Feast of the Trumpets, as well as all the other feasts, were required. And in their minds are still required today because they, they still live under the law. Um, and so this is something they, they have to do. It's not really a choice. Um, if, if you read on down where, where Glenn was reading in Leviticus, it talks about if, you, if anyone does not humble themselves on this day, they will be cut off from their people. And guys, that was everything. That was everything to them. They would be cut off. They would not have any part of Israel. They would not have any part of the temple. They would not have any part of their inheritance, which was the land. They would not have any part of worship and knowing God, you know, very pious. Uh, we worship God, you know, we don't know what you do, or we don't care if you do or not, but we worship God. That was important. That is important to them. Um, so just keep that in mind. So the feasts and the accompanying sacrifices that go with them are required each year by the law. The Hebrews in chapter 10 tells us that the blood of bulls and goats can never take away sin. So the Jewish people are reminded every year of their sins. We as believers, on the other hand, we're reminded also in the book of Hebrews that we have a better sacrifice, a complete sacrifice in Jesus, who by one sacrifice forever took away our sins at the cross. How much more we should remember the high cost that our Savior paid because of our sins, the sorrow that they bring to us and God, and that he has broken the rule of sin in our lives. Remember, the word means broken or to break. So, you know, God broke that rule and reign of sin in our lives. Hallelujah. So, Nathan, would you play this shivery? Okay, excellent. Now, the third blast we're going to get to is known as teruah. So these are nine staccato blasts, very rapid. And they're considered a wake-up call. And it's accompanied, or should be accompanied, by genuine deep sorrow for one's sinful behavior and actions and should bring about true repentance. And you'll see that if you ever attend, say, an Orthodox service, or even some Messianic services will go very deep into this at their, because they, they do this, that Messianic Jews, even though they're Believers, they believe in Jesus, they believe in Yeshua, they follow these laws, not, not for their salvation, but because tradition, you, know, you name it, you know, we can, we can argue that or talk about that later, I'm not going to now. But it's very, very dear and very serious to them. So, um, they want to have true repentance before God. So, as ones who would follow Jesus, we must have genuine repentance, a turning from our sin, so we can follow in our Savior's steps. So Nathan, would you sound the teruah? Good. You kind of noticed that was a little bit of staccato. I've, again, just a little side note. They say you're supposed to blow like eight notes, and a lot of people will blow nine, just so they make sure they get enough. And they <laughs> like, you know, kind of like the hedging of the law, you know, we'll make sure we don't overstep our bounds or or anything, so just make sure you get enough in there. So, uh, again, wherever you read, that's basically what you're looking for. So we come to the fourth and the final blast, 
is known as Takia Ha Gadol. This is very similar to the regular Takia blast, which we heard first, except that it is longer and it's grander. Ha Gadol means the great or the long, the grand, big, large. Uh, that's the idea. Um, so it's basically the same, except it's larger, longer, and grander. Haggadol, um, it means great, and it's desired, it's desired, whether we can do it or not, it's desired <laughs> that the one who is blowing the shell for would hold this note out for as long as possible, hopefully as long as you have breath to breathe through it. Not required, but that's the idea. That's what we want to get. <laughs> that's up to you. <laughs> but that's the point. So it's with this blast. This blast brings hope and joy, a redemption and victory. As Christians, we look forward to hearing that trumpet blast that Paul talks about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And with the sound of the trumpet, we who belong to Jesus Christ will realize the fulfillment of hope we have in him, we'll have joy at meeting our Savior face to face, when we who are the redeemed will have a final victory over sin and death. Nathan, please sound the Takiya Haggadol. <laughs> together. But before we do that, I would like to, in I guess my own tradition that I kind of follow, I, I believe it's correct and proper, um, to say a blessing over the shofar. If you notice in, in the Jewish lifestyle, there's pretty much a blessing for almost everything. For those of you who have ever watched the movie Fiddler on the Roof, they even had a blessing over the czar. May the Lord bless and keep the czar far from here. That's not going to cost you that But in all seriousness, I, I would like to uh, honor this little ceremony by reciting a blessing. So I'll recite it in Hebrew and then I'll recite it in English, and then Nathan and I will let you take it away. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Ashir Kidshanu, Uvedom, Yeshua Hamashiach, Vitzivanu, Lishmoa, Kol Shofar. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who sanctified us by the blood of Yeshua the Messiah and commanded us to hear the call of the Shofar. There's three for the second, there's nine for the third. Okay, they would repeat that series till they got 99 blasts, and then to wrap it up, they would have the last trumpet, which is the um, Takiya Haggadah. Okay, that's important for you to remember that. Stick that in your brain, write it in a note, write it on your spouse's forehead. <laughs> you, we need to remember that because that's going to play a key role in how this affects us. All right? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, that you teach us, that your spirit gifts us with insight that we would not otherwise have on our own. We thank you that your spirit leads us into all knowledge and wisdom. I ask, Father, that you would bless the reading of the word today, Father, that it would settle deep in our hearts and our souls, that, Father, with it would come understanding. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.